Hey, well, welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And I have Scott Miller joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah. Yay, yay, Scott. Hey, Scott, you have two different shirts on. Is it cold? Well, it's the first day of fall. So it was a little chilly this morning. So I had this short sleeve shirt on and I had the top down on my car driving my sons to school. So I ended up putting a like a thermal shirt under it. So pardon my, pardon this. It was a fall kind of thing this morning. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, is Scott was on the show uh, back in October of 2021 for the Master Mentor Number One series. We're just now approaching one year and he said he was going to do this. Uh, This was Master Mentor Number Two, where he's chosen 30 more people that are part of this series that he's on. And I will let my listeners know a little bit about you. Scott is a highly sought after speaker, author, and podcast host. Uh, He is Wall Street Journal bestselling author and currently serves as Franklin Covey's senior advisor on thought leadership. Prior to his advisory roles, Scott was a 25-year Franklin Covey associate serving as the chief marketing officer and executive vice president. Um, he hosts the On Leadership with Scott Miller, where you can get that. You can just go to scottmiller.com. And that's where you can pick up more about him. World's largest and fastest growing weekly leadership podcast. So Scott, I know you put a lot of effort in this and I appreciate you as an individual and a person. And you've chosen 30 people. You and I were just going through the list, comparing notes of who the people were that we both have interviewed for our shows. And we, we just shared some, some uh, intellectual property between people. And I appreciate that because, you know, your series focuses on leadership, but it focuses on a lot more. It focuses yeah. on marketing, it's right. focused on sales. But in the introduction of the book, you spoke about Bruce Williams the most influential mentor in your life, somebody that you've n- never met or had a conversation with, but absolutely your master mentor. Uh, can you share this story with the listeners and why you're so passionate about doing this series on master mentoring? I think you've got planned, what, five of these or how many? Ten, ten volumes. Yeah, ten, ten volumes. Okay, yeah. well, that means every year he's going to be doing right. another volume, right. or maybe sooner. So tell us about Bruce Williams and why he's your master mentor. I'd be honored. Greg, thanks again for the spotlight and the platform. You and I have a lot in common. We like to shine the spotlight on other people. I think you and I have, uh, maybe we're brothers from a different mother. Uh, <laughs> but then I opened the book, Master Mentors Volume 2, where I shine the spotlight on 30 new mentors drawn for the podcast, 10-year 10 volume book deal with Harper Collins. I just finished volume three, by the way, will come out next October. Great people in volume three, Robin Sharma, Ariana Huffington, Mel Robbins, Deepak Chopra, Adam Grant. It's going to be great. Volume three is going to be awesome. Yeah. But, but to your point, I'm kind of redefining what it means to be mentor to be a mentor. Most of us think of our mentors as being in the C-suite on the fourth floor, a 10th floor, and it's somebody you go and meet with weekly for coffee. And that's also true. But I also think that if you really think about it, most of us have been mentored by people that don't know who we are. Perhaps we read their books, we listen to their podcasts, we go follow them at conferences to hear their speeches. And one such person for me was a man named Bruce Williams. He really founded this whole idea of talk radio back in the 80s. He had a radio program Monday through Friday for three hours. It was sort of like Dave Ramsey meets the shark tank, right? Where you called in and you asked questions and he was a lawyer, an entrepreneur. I think he was like in the town council and kind of homespun wisdom, but really good experience-based wisdom where he talked about why you needed a will, why you needed uh, uh, an attorney to close a real estate transaction, right? What was term insurance versus whole insurance? And He just gave you good advice on how to manage your finances, launch a business, care for your family. And he actually launched Sally Jesse Raphael. She actually was a psychiatrist or psychologist, and he helped to launch her after his program. Well, anyway, after listening to Bruce Williams' radio show during junior high school and high school for nearly eight years, three hours a night, when most of my friends were probably listening to YouTube, 
on the, or not YouTube, you two on the radio, I was listening to this call and talk show. My point is Bruce Williams died not even knowing Scott Miller was alive. Never met him, never interviewed him, never spoke to him. But without question, Bruce Williams was the most influential mentor in my life. And so I opened the book, Master Mentors, talking about him to remind you all that the 30 people that are in Master Mentors or the 300 from my podcast or the hundreds from Greg's podcast, they could absolutely be your mentors as you take insights, what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. I very much believe that we learn more from people's mistakes than we do their successes. So I don't have Greg's wisdom. I don't have Greg's good looks. I don't have Greg's finances. I can't replicate what Greg does well for the most part. But what I can do is I can learn from his mistakes and learn from his foibles and avoid them. Heck, half the success in life is just not doing stupid stuff, quite frankly. So that's why I opened the story, not as a master mentor, but as an intro to kind of rescope what it means to have mentors in your life, recognizing that you are probably the mentor to other people that you don't even know it. You oh, I'm sure. It. I'm sure maybe there are some out there that, you know, are faithful listeners. Maybe I'm a mentor too. But I think more importantly is I go back to, we were talking about uh, Cynthia uh, Howler Covey and the book uh, Life in Crescendo about contribution. You know, I think for me, this show is about how can I contribute to people? How can I help and serve in a way? Um, and, you know, my nonprofit, Compassionate Communications, that serves the homeless. To me, this is a way to give back. And, you know, you state that your hope in authoring the book is to present master mentors to the listeners to invite them to enter a similar type of relationship with any of the mentors presented in the book, of which there's 30. Can you tell the story about how you selected these 30 mentors for this one? You just talked about volume three already. Uh, and you gave us, you dropped some really big names in there like Deepak and all the rest of them. And now, and how their transformational insights resonated with Scott Miller. More yep. importantly, because, you know, when you're an author, regardless of if, if it's picking interviews or whatever it might be, you can only have to carefully go through, Scott, and choose what you think is going to resonate with your audiences yep. and what you want to get out. And I'm really curious to get into your head as to how you select it. I have a very short little teeny list here, but I see your list. How you selected these people and why? You know, Greg, most publishers will tell authors, don't write for you, write for your audience. And I think that's smart. But I don't know that I always follow that wisdom because what I've done is I've written what resonated with me as a father, as a husband, as a brother, as a, as a, as a parent, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a guy who has a stutter, as a guy who wishes he had a higher net worth and wish I had better friendships, right? I'm just a normal guy making it through life every day, trying to pay the mortgage and raise three kids and keep my marriage together. Maybe pay for their college if I'm lucky. So I, what I did is I curated insights that I thought would help my life because I don't think I'm that different than most people, right? I say stupid things and I do stupid things and I offer apologies and I'm jealous and I'm insecure and I'm successful. And I'm a hard worker. I'm, I'm just like everybody else in the world. I have a little more courage than most people. And that sometimes serves me well and sometimes doesn't. But what I did is I try to curate 30 people that I think have a transformational insight shared on the podcast or maybe even off. As you know, most of the good stuff is shared before and after the camera goes live, right? So with their permission, I curated 30 insights that I thought would help people in all their roles in life. And they're intentionally episodic. It might be about your personal finance or building your brand or parenting or entrepreneurship or creating better systems for your business or just thinking about your legacy or your family traditions. It's very episodic intentionally. And so I share a spotlight on people from different backgrounds. I try to mix it up with different people from different nationalities, different races, different genders, different generations, different industries. Some of them are world famous celebrities and some of them you've never heard of, mm -hmm. but they survived a commercial Pakistani plane crash and lived to tell about it 
and there are amazing lessons from his story. So I try not to make it a jumbled mess, but a little bit of a, you know, read it at night for 12 minutes as you're going to bed, close the book and pick it up tomorrow, not having to remember what you read the day before. So that's kind of how I like to read books is short chapters. I ask some profound questions. I share some stories about myself. And I think it's working pretty well because volume one sold well and volume two is sold out. The book launches in about two weeks and it's already sold out on pre-order and I'm delighted about that. So those printing presses better start running. <laughs> so question, uh, I got the impression and I want to give this correctly to my listening audience. You have cards with this one with QR I codes do. on it. I do. And those QR codes are designed to take the listener exactly where. So the cards and the book are purchased together, right? Well, no, not exactly. So in the book, at the end of each chapter, I have a QR code. Okay. And that QR code takes you exactly to that podcast episode, both video and audio. Like you, my podcast was on video. Right. So those QR codes are at the end of each chapter. But additionally, when I speak on the book, which is multiple times a week, headed to Croatia tomorrow to speak on it, um, I actually don't use PowerPoint. I only use card decks. So every keynote I give, there actually is a printed card deck that comes in a little box. I don't use slides. And on the back of each of the mentors, the, the insight is shared, but there also is the QR code on the back of the card deck that also will take you to their episode. So if you like the um, episode with John Gordon, the energy bus, right? Or yeah. Bobby Herrera or Marie Forleo, the card deck at my keynote speeches takes you right to their podcast, but those same QR codes are in the printed book as now, well. Now, can our listeners get those co uh, cards or are those cards only available at your speeches? Listen, if your listeners want to send me a message on LinkedIn uh -huh. and connect to me and give me their shipping address, I will send them a complimentary set of cards. Okay. I'd love it if they buy the book. You don't have to buy the book to get the card decks. It'd be a nice thing. But if you want to find me on LinkedIn, you can't miss me. Send me a message. Tell me you saw me on Greg's awesome podcast and give me your shipping address. I won't come to your house. I promise I'll ship you a free deck of cards. Well, I got that there's a QR code in the book. So if they get the book, they're going to get the same thing, really, right. in essence. Um, yeah. But sometimes, you know, you never know. They want to share a card with somebody sure. and they say, here, yeah. go. You know, I'm thinking for you, because this book is doing so well, the cards ought to be out there with the people and they ought to be sharing it. Say, I just bought this great Master Mentor Volume yes. 2 series. Here's a card and go listen to this podcast, it's by true. the way, by the book. <laughs> it's true. I want to be thoughtful not to put the mentors in a position that I'm out selling their image yeah. to earn money. So I generally don't sell the card deck. Got it. We provide it with our keynotes. Okay. Um, but well, yeah, look, I, I you, out of respect you, to the mentors. You do an, an amazing job of organizing the content and the data in the book. In the first part of the book, you featured a very sad story about uh, Zafar, is it yeah. Masad? Who took Zafar place in May, Masood, yes. Masood, May 20th, 2020. Can you tell the listeners, let the listeners more a little bit about that story and insights? Because that's a very interesting story. He's the opening mentor in volume two, master mentor number 31. His name is Zafar Basud. He is the CEO of the Bank of Punjab, a large bank in Pakistan. And as the CEO of this bank, he flies between the offices quite frequently, Lahore to Karachi. He always seats, sits in seat 1B, business class aisle seat. This particular flight was just after the pandemic had exploded and airlines were back in the air fairly. He gets to the uh, airport early one day and notices that the airline has him in seat 1A. He always sits in seat 1B, 1B, manages to get his seat changed, moves to 1B. Plane takes off. Hour or so flight, the plane lands in Lahore. But as soon as the plane lands, it takes back off again. Kind of a really rough landing. Plane takes back off again, comes back around for a second landing. And what no one knew was that the pilots had failed to lower the landing gear. This is a this is a you know reputable airline in Pakistan. Anyone here could fly it if you were over in Asia. The pilots have forgot to lower the landing gear, so when they landed, they damaged the engines irreparably. Plane comes back around, crashes and explodes in a residential area, hits all these buildings, and Zafar Masood survives. Ninety eight passengers and crew perish. Two people live. Two passengers. Zafar 
and one other person. Wow. Zafar, the plane breaks apart. Zafar, seat, leaves the plane with him still buckled in, falls from the sky. Now listen, everybody, to this. It's incomprehensible. He falls from the sky, upright, alive, unconscious, on fire, strapped into his airline seat. It hits the top of a building, slides down, and he lands on the hood of a car, upright, <laughs> strapped in, alive, unconscious, on fire. There are two young men sitting in the car, getting ready to turn it on to go to work that morning. And all of a sudden, all the windows blow out of their car, including the windshield, and they come to, and there's a man sitting on their hood, alive, upright, in an airline seat, on fire, unconscious. They rescue him. And he lives with enormous survivor's grief, survivor's guilt to tell this story. And the insight in the book is, what do you do when you survived a commercial airline crash? What's next? So I write a whole series of questions around, what would you do? What's next for you? And I shared some tender stories around, as a dad, I got to create some more traditions for our three sons. They're eight, they're 10, and they're 12. And I got to live every day as if I just survived the airline crash and I'm going to go take the world by storm. So that's just one of 30 like jaw-dropping stories. People that survived massive traumas or people that, you know, just did something really cool by working their butts off and what you can learn from it. Well, I know for a fact that the experience, you know, they, they, when they say, when they say write a book, you know, you had me on the edge of the seat there with the story, not only the way you told it, but I'm sure the way he experienced it as well. But the point is, it's about the experience. And they always say to write if you're in a theater whispering in someone's ear something special, right? I always love that. And Scott, you might not have been whispering right now, but the message that came through as a mentor was what more can you contribute as a result of this tragic event, the tragedy that you had in your life? Can you, like you said, you started writing questions for your sons. What more can I do now um, to, to make this better, right? To make this world a better place. And you have so many people in there. You have BJ Fogg and you have, you know, Guy Kawasaki and you've got all these great mentors in there and many of them been on my show. Uh, yep. You have Rita McGrath seeing around corners, you know, all this. There's a chapter in there from Sean Covey, and you state mm. that he shared his opinion about the differences between self-worth, self-esteem, and self-confidence. And I think this is really important. Out of the nine children, Cynthia is the oldest. Right. But out of the nine children, what I realized from Cynthia that most of the world probably doesn't know is that Stephen Covey tried to treat all of his children equally tried, but it wasn't always a success, but tried. In other words, think about that as a father with the, how busy he was trying to spend time with all of these nine children and spread his time and do it. And she tells a great story in there. They all sound quite similar. Uh, and I'm talking about Sean Covey right now. And I think most of us lump them into a similar category. I know, I certainly did. What advice can you give the listeners about self-worth, self-esteem, and self-confidence as it relates to the Sean Covey story? Because all of us as a father, as a husband, you're now trying to live your life so that you can give your children equal time, right? And you're trying to bring them up with self-worth, self-confidence, self-esteem, whatever it might be. Tell the story in the book and how that impacted you and how, as a mentor, you saw it as something you needed to tell. Thanks, Greg. To your point, Sean Covey is one of the nine children of the iconic author, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, who wrote the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and was the genesis now of the Franklin Covey Company, the world's largest and most trusted leadership firm in the world. He also is the book, author of many books, including The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, which is the most successful team leadership book in history. 
Uh, Sean is the president of our ex of our education division, and he were on the ex he and I were on the executive team for a decade together. And I think of all the things that Sean Covey has taught me, which are immense. One day in passing, a decade ago, Sean he's been on the podcast. Sean said to me, he, he wrote a book called "The Six Most Important Decisions You'll Ever Make," and it's a book written aimed at teenagers. I think it's a masterpiece, and I read it. As a single guy, like 10 years ago, wasn't even married yet, had no kids, wasn't married, playing tennis, traveling the world. And I read the book one day in a plane and said, Sean, Sean, this book is amazing. The six most important decisions you'll ever make. It's a great book if you're a parent. And then in this conversation, Sean taught me the difference between self-worth, self-esteem, and self-confidence. And I think that big insight is we tend to use those terms, I think, a bit interchangeably, unconsciously, right? Self-worth, yeah. self-esteem, self-confidence. No, they're actually quite different. Sean taught me the concept that your self-worth is creator-given. If you're religious, it's God-given. If you're not, it's some, something created you. But Sean believes that your self-worth is inherent. All of us have the same amount of self-worth. You can't lessen it or increase it. Your self-worth is complete. And all of us have the same self-worth. It's creator given. And I thought, I'm a religious person, but I thought even if I wasn't, that seems logical to me. No one can impact adversely or positively my self-worth because my self-worth is the same as Sean Covey's is. And I write a tender story about how sometimes I was quite jealous of Sean Covey in the executive team meetings because it was always, well, how is your father? How is your mother? No one ever asked how my mother or my father was. And I always felt a little inferior to the celebrities in the Covey family. And it had nothing to do with them. It had to do with me. My self-worth was the same as Sean Covey's or Roger Federer or Brene Brown or you name it. My, my self-worth is the same. Now, my self-confidence and my self-esteem very wildly based on lots of things, right? How I view myself, what are my priorities? What are my values? And so I really wanted people to understand your self-worth is inherent and don't let anybody try to lessen it because they can't and either can you. Focus on your self-esteem and your self-confidence. Read the book to learn how we define those and some of the things that can lessen them or strengthen them, recognizing that, you know, if you assess and judge yourself on measures that truly matter, no one, nothing can decrease or maybe even increase your self-esteem or your self-confidence because you're in control of it. It's a good chapter. I think that's the most important thing is that you are in control of it. Now, the, the other insight from a psychological standpoint is that's what we have to work on. That's why we call this personal growth mastery. That's why we talk at human potential movement. It's because it's our job to take responsibility for our own potential. It's nobody else's job. You and I, every day when we get on a podcast and these words flow through these speakers that people are listening to, it could be one sentence, it could be a paragraph, it could be something. But that has to stick with somebody, and then somebody has to take it and do some action with it. Something other than just, oh, that was a great podcast that yeah. Greg Voison did with Scott Millen. No, it isn't about the thousands of words. It's maybe about the 15 or 16 words that you take from this. Like what Scott just said, I think the delineation between self-worth, self-confidence, self-esteem, those are really important. It's really important. Now, so Greg, Greg, quick yes. introduction. When I wanted to feature Sean Covey, I mentioned this and Sean said, yeah, I don't know much about that. I, I don't know. You should feature me on that topic. And I said, no, actually, Sean, it was profound. Now, I'm not I'm not an intellectual, right? I don't I'm, I don't have a background in philosophy or the human condition. Right. I'm just a guy trying to get along. But I found it profound just understanding there is a difference in and, and you can or cannot raise them based on which one they are. And quite frankly, if you're in control, nothing anybody else does can impact any of the three of those. You have complete control over it. Well, it's a great point you made. And again, if that one point gets through today to the listening audience, it's going to be it's going to be great. Now, look, 
we've both had both had Chester Elton on. Um, yes. Chest, Chester this chapter about anxiety in the workplace with Chester yeah. Elton. No, look, we we all went through this COVID together. We all had plenty of anxiety in the workplace. Now we're seeing inflation the way it is, and people are looking at, you know, maybe jobs being rolled off and whatever, and the anxiety, am I going to be able to do it is. You state that you learned the most about branding from Chester. Uh Um, Can you tell our listeners about Chester Elton and the teachings that he shared with you about branding? And while you're at it, you know, look, this Anxiety in the workplace is a real thing. We've all been talking about this for a long time. So um, I love Chester. I love what he's doing. He and his partner. Great book. Yep. Great book. Uh, Tell us why you picked Chester. Yeah. One of your 30. Well, I'm going to address both of your points. So Chester Elton, of course, is a very famous author, coach, podcaster, speaker, He's really known about employee appreciation. He's written extensively about how to build cultures where people feel appreciated and valued and choose to stay. He's written extensively about gratitude. And his last book was called Anxiety in the Workplace. And it really had a profound impact on me. I do not suffer from depression or anxiety. I do not have suicidal tendencies or ideation. I don't know if it's my genetics or my personality or my... um, environment, but I'm very blessed not to be um, afflicted by that. But one of my employees is, and a man who works for me in his 20s has crippling clinical depression and anxiety and has uh, some PTSD and and is uh, an absolute genius, MacGyver. He works super hard. And there are times when he can't come to work for four days because he's considering taking his life. I mean, it's, that's how severe it is. And he's under the, under the therapy of a physician and he has medications that change periodically and he manages his stress really well. And as a hard charging entrepreneur, it's hard for me not to have to employ a guy that I'm paying him out of my kid's college budget, right? And our business not to come to work for four days. And so I've had to really change my mentality to understand how to create a culture. I don't cause him more stress because his value to me is incalculable when he is working which is the vast majority of time. So I actually turned the chapter over to my associate, this 25-year-old kid, and he writes an open letter to all of those people who do have anxiety. And then he writes a similar open letter to all the Scott Miller leaders who don't on how to work with them. It's a lovely chapter. I basically turn it over to my 25-year-old employee named Drew Young. Now, to answer your other question around Chester and Brand, you know, for those of you who know Chester, you know he wrote a very famous book called The Carrot Principle with his business partner, Adrian Gostick. And he became sort of known as the apostle of appreciation. He's very animated. He wears orange everywhere he goes. He gives out little little stuffed um, carrots. Like plush uh, mm-hmm. carrots in the audience. And he's hysterical. He's, he's insanely competent. And he's a wildly uh, uh, fun, engaging entertainer. And so you might think that his brand is the guy that wears orange glasses and orange socks and orange tie. And that's it. And that's also true. But Chester's real brand is he's loyal. He holds confidences. He's punctual. He makes and keeps commitments. He doesn't gossip. I text Chester, Chester, I need your wisdom for 10 minutes. My plane's landing in Dublin in 30. I'll call you then. Chester, I need 15 minutes to walk through an issue I've got. I'm coming off the stage in 30 minutes. I'll call you on my way to the airport. I mean, he's just always there for me. I think his brand is a guy who shows up for his friends and he makes and keeps commitments and doesn't gossip and keeps confidences. And so the brand that I want to reinforce is independent of his, you know, on stage razzle dazzle, you know, apostle of appreciation. It's hysterical. He's an amazing keynoter. That's his show. And at the end of the day, off, off air, He is smart and wise and contemplative and deliberate. And I've said it for the third time, Chester simply makes and keeps commitments. And when he can't, he calls you up and said, my bad, I made a mistake. I can't do that deal because I just reviewed my contract and it precludes me. I'm sorry. Um, How can I make it up to you? That actually happened with Chester and I. Um, 
Ask yourself, what's your brand? Beyond whether you wear cufflinks or how you dress or what kind of briefcase you carry, what's your real brand? Do you make and keep commitments? Do you tell the truth? When you inflate something, do you say, actually, that's not true? Do you ever in meetings say, you know what? Whose idea was that? Oh, yeah, mine. That was ridiculous. Who's got a better idea than that, right? Is Are you there to be the genius? Or to quote Liz Wiseman, are you there to be the genius maker of others? And I hope in this chapter, which is mainly focused on anxiety and how to lead employees who have anxiety, crippling or just, you know, less so, that you also think about what your brand is as well. And have you behaved your have you behaved yourself into the brand you deserve and want? And I think you speak with Chester about character because his brand is character, both as a character and his character uh, stands for itself, just what you said, because of his integrity, his humility, his ability to come back to you and say, look, I messed up. How can I make it up to you? His yeah. honesty, his trust, yeah. all the words you want to use to describe our character. And that brand becomes a character, you know, that it's like Scott Miller. He's a character and he's got yeah. a great brand. Yeah. Now shifting gears a bit. Um, I became pretty good friends with David Sibbett. Uh -huh. And as a result of me doing, I'm going to say idea salon, solve next. I'm very much into visual learning. Um, you've had David on the show and he's authored several books about visual learning and has a firm in um, uh, San Francisco. Yep. Um, and he is, in my estimation, and I'm not going to put anybody on a pedestal, he's the grandfather of it. Yes. He really Yes. Is. Yes, absolutely. He's probably in his late 70s now. Yep. And, but again, you just talked about Chester and character. I have never met a man so more impeccable than mm. David Sibbett mm. um, about how he works with people in visual learning. Talk with us. Why did you choose David Sibbett? And why was visual learning of a guy like yourself, who's like literally like, oh, you know, uh, really interesting to you? Oh, I so hope people buy the book because the chapter on David Sibbett is worth the book alone. David Sibbett, to your uh, agreement is the godfather, grandfather of visual communication, wrote a litany of books called Visual Leadership, Visual Meetings, Visual Teams. Communication. He's he's a master artist. He is. But what he's done brilliantly is he's communicated what he calls seven frames and seven figures that anybody like me who is not a visual artist can use to build your credibility inside of your organization. For example, when you are in a team meeting at the CEO's house and you're unfortunately given the magic marker and your job is to go up to the chart pad and capture the notes for two days or two hours, you don't know whether to put the information into a four box model or into a Venn diagram or how to, how to draw stick people or you know all that kind of stuff. And I'm an actually, I think, competent verbal communicator. I was stutter. I'm a lifelong stutter. I've mentioned that frequently and it has sometimes hijacked my visual my verbal communication but what i've often been jealous of is that same person that they get the marker unfortunately to be the proctor and then they just beautifully capture all the information they know what to capture what not to capture how to organize it how to emphasize it and i think it's an art now perhaps it's an art more so when we were less hybrid and less virtual but a lot of us are very much back in the offices to some extent and we're in meetings and we're looking to influence people David teaches these seven figures and seven frames, how to draw a circle, how to draw a stick figure, how to draw a throw line, how to draw a star, when to put information into what he calls a Mandela or a four box model, how to emphasize stuff. And these skills I think are vital for anyone who's trying to improve their credibility as someone who can actually illustrate your ideas. At the end of the day, unless you have a sight impairment, I think all of us have some level a visual learning, right? Whether it's tactile or auditory, whatever it is. Look at me behind me. Look at you behind you, right? And so when I was at the Disney company 30 years ago, one of the arts that an intern had from graduate school was the ability to take kind of 
data in written words to bring it to life in a business plan that people like me could actually see and digest really easily. And David has exploded this in his books and his company, The Grove Consultants. Um, I don't do a very good job at implementing his art because I'm a fairly frenetic person and I want to capture everything or nothing. I get overwhelmed easily. But these, these seven figures and seven frames, which are a fraction, fraction of David's, you know, content, he graciously allowed me to share in the book. And if you're looking to increase your credibility, whether it's at a whiteboard, a chart pad, at a conference, at a team meeting, you want to look really smart in a team meeting, read David's book, pick up the chapter of mine, and it will transform your sense of confidence and your credibility. And maybe you're, maybe you're creating a deck, right? Maybe you're creating just a deck and you're drawing or sketching it out or whatever it is. His skills are invaluable. Like you said, he's a little quirky. He's got a great personality, lost his wife several years ago, right. and then um, found a new love and married her. And I just am a big fan of David Sibbett. Well, there's a term that's used for people that are very, very uh, proficient at this skill, and it's a graphic facilitator. Yes. And David is the creme de la creme when it comes yes. to yes. graphic facilitators. I have friends that are graphic facilitators, and they studied under David. Uh, myself, I understand the basics of this. Yep. I wouldn't consider myself an artist, but I can get up at a whiteboard and do what you just talked about. And I think it's really important. Now, your book, you know, with these 30 people, uh, Scott, what I want to do is direct our listeners to scottjeffreymiller.com. Go there. Uh, you can order this book, Master Mentors number three. Uh, I'm sorry, number two. number two. I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself because you already That's talked okay. about three. <laughs> it's true. There it's is going to be a three coming out. Um, and, you know, everybody from Michael Hyatt, to David Sibbett, we don't have time to cover all of these people. That's why you need to go get the book. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, Scott, in each chapter, you know, there's transformational insights. If you were to leave our listeners with one or two transformational insights, um, which ones would you say would be yeah. the greatest ones? And what would be how they can integrate that advice into their life today? If there's something that just stood out for you, yeah, yes. master men or two, yep. and you said, okay, there's, you know, there's BJ Fogg and his tiny habits and you got to yep. do this. Tell yeah. us what it is. <laughs> well, they're all equal in their, I think, profoundness. It just depends on where it hits the reader, where they are in their life, right? Uh, yeah. That's why I wrote the book to be very short chapters. I think the one that I probably share the most is Bobby Herrera. He's the second mentor. He's number 32. So one through 30 were the mentors in chapter one and 31 through 60 are chapter two. You mean book in book two. one. You mean in book one. Book one. Thank you. <laughs> Volume one. Thank you. Thank you. So Bobby Herrera is a very famous entrepreneur. He wrote a book called The Gift of Struggle. It's a very short hardcover book called The Gift of Struggle. And he shares a remarkable story that you cannot read without becoming emotional. It's the second chapter in the book, volume two, where I don't have time to share the whole story, but basically he and his brother were on a high school football team as immigrant Mexicans living in Texas with very little funds. And every Friday night, the, the football team stopped after their game and they all went in and had dinner at a restaurant, except for Bobby Herrera and his brother who stayed on the bus and ate the brown bag dinner their mom had packed for them because there was no money for the Herrera brothers to go into the dinner. And it wasn't the Roos Chris, it was more like the Sizzler. But everybody just knew the Herrera brothers stayed on the bus. How humiliating every football game to stay on the bus and eat your sandwich your mom packed you while your 40 friends are all in having soft serve ice cream and sirloin tips at the Sizzler. Well, one night, one of the team, team member's father, a successful businessman, reboards the bus walks back to the Herrera brothers and says, join us for dinner. It's on me. No one's going to know. Do me a favor in exchange. Pay it forward sometime later in life. And Bobby says it was the first time in his life he ever felt seen by someone. 12th grade. I'm getting emotional telling the story, Craig, because that man reboarded that bus and had no idea the profound impact it would have inviting Bobby and his brother just into dinner. I don't know if it was a sizzler, but the point was it wasn't, you know, a hundred dollar dinner. 
Right. And Bobby said that no one in his life had ever made him feel seen before. Well, I go on to tell an amazing story how 30 years later, Bobby writes this book called The Gift of Struggle. He's this wildly successful entrepreneur. He finds the father 30 years later, a man named Harold Teague, still alive, hadn't talked to him, invites Harold to come to the book launch where he shares this whole story for the first time ever in public. And everybody is dying in the audience, crying, including Harold Teague. He had no idea why he was even there. Later says to Bobby, I remember that day. I had no idea the impact on you. It's an amazing story, but the idea to your point to take away is who will you reboard the bus for? Who will you made, who will you make feel seen today? Will it be someone on your team? Will it be your mother-in-law, your neighbor? <laughs> Pardon me. All of us have power, positional power, financial power, intellectual power, principle-centered power, coercive power, utility power. All of us have power. All of us have power to make someone feel seen. And so the question is, is who will you board the bus for? I think that's a great way to leave this. And you're, what you're letting my listeners know, and, and Scott, I just love the energy that you put behind the story. And that Thank story you, really helps people to see what is possible with just taking that extra little step to help somebody, you know, I, I, my authors who make contributions to my nonprofit, I tell them I'm very grassroots. I go out and I hand out hundred dollar gift cards to guys on the streets. Mm. And that's what I do. And, you know, I have stories that I've compiled from them just by taking my iPhone and recording sure. and saying, how did you get out on the street? And it's one little helping hand because you never know what's going to happen um, with somebody like that. That if one person steps up just like this guy did on the back of the bus and said guys come on in have dinner uh i just i gave a card to a guy the other day at a, at a bus stop he knew he knew what he wanted to do is take the train to oregon i said great take this gift card and buy yourself a ticket go to oregon that's where you get your, that's what you got to do to get out of town but my point is is that your show my show this book both books provide great stories for the listeners to actually look at and question things in their lives about yep. what they can change. Well said. What they can make better. And I appreciate you. Every time I'm on, I learn more and more. Every right. time we're on, we share great people that we can you know, collaborate with. So thank you so much. I know you've got to beeline out of here and get on another call, but you are a blessing. Namaste to you, man. Namaste Thanks to so you, much. sir. Thanks so much for being on Inside Personal Growth. My honor, Greg. Thanks for the spotlight.